That is the wrong video. Well, I apologize for the technical difficulties. We'll get it. and I apologize for that rough start, but welcome to today's webinar. This is part three in our four-part series, Leveraging Public Relations to Build Your Adult Education Brand. And today our webinar is hosted and presented by Full Capacity Marketing. And with that, I will hand it over to Selena Shantz, CEO. Thank you. Hi, thanks, James. We're having some a little bit of fun in the chat box today. I know everybody's been talking about the snowy weather, but I asked kind of a controversial question. So we have to be nice here. But who is your Super Bowl pick? So I have to admit, I have been a Lions fan since I was eight years old. Uh, we had to see Greg Landry play in the Silver Dome in Detroit. And they've had 
Oh, I see Packers, Baltimore Ravens. Okay, good. And I know Annika here. She's both Philadelphia and, and Kansas City. So you're still in Annika. It's yeah. a good thing. <laughs> Anyway, I thought we'd have a little bit of fun. It's so great to see everybody here today. And uh, Annika, if we could get the slide deck going, I um, want to pull up today and just, uh, I did put in a link to download this deck. You're going to go to a share file form and you just input your contact information and then um, you'll be able to download this full deck. And I would encourage it because we've got a lot of great resources and links on the deck, active links. Um, so with that, uh, if we go to the next slide, I am Selena Shans. I'm the CEO and founder of Full Capacity Marketing here with Annika Jackson, our VP of PR. And if you don't know about Full Capacity Marketing, we have worked nationally with workforce and education organizations all over the country for the past 21 going on 22 years. So we have a big fire in our belly, as we say, for your mission. We've helped more than 500 organizations across the nation build a relevant brand, um, recruit students, and also engage employers. We've also been a proud partner with CoAbe since 2017, where we've launched now four campaigns in collaboration with them and their leadership, uh, Move Ahead with Adult Ed, which we'll talk about today, um, Educate and Elevate, which has brought more than $5 million in additional funding to the system, Behind Every Employer, and our latest one last September, which we'll also be talking about during a case study today called Impacts That Count. So, Annika, I'm going to toss it to you for intro. You are so well suited to teach this curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really excited to talk about the latest and greatest in PR and uh, again, I'm Annika Jackson, VP of Public Relations at Full Capacity Marketing. And I also teach PR and branding uh, in the grad program at USC Annenberg. And I also teach on the digital media management side. Today, everything is so interlinked. It's really important to think about that. And there's so much going on. Um, and we know that there are a lot of challenges that you all have as well when you're trying to navigate the PR landscape uh, when it comes to having partners and, you know, who's doing what and how to promote yourselves effectively. And so we're really excited to tee up PR as part of that strategy to go along with all of your digital campaigns and other campaigns that you have running. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Annika. And I also will mention that Annika has her own podcast okay. called uh, The Brand Amplified, um, your brand amplified, and it has over 50,000 viewers per month and over 5,500 five-star ratings and growing. I always have to say that after those stats, because every time I check in with Annika, it's more and more. So Annika, <laughs> maybe you can pop that in the chat too, uh, because sure, that thanks. podcast is such a wonderful resource for folks. You know, in general, it's interesting, you know, we are marketing and communications experts and we have trouble keeping up with everything in the field. So I know you all do. And what we try to do is take all that information, assimilate it, and then adapt it in your world. What does it mean for workforce and education? So if you go to the next slide, you'll see, um, I wanted to do a quick recap of webinars one and two. And if you missed those, don't worry, they're on CoAbe's website in the archived webinar section. So you can look that up and you can certainly, um, you know, catch up because the information does build on one another. In the first webinar, we just talked about this concept of positioning, why brand building is a have to have and just some of the foundational elements what was good about that session, it really got you grounded in what is a good message and or effective message, I should say, in an ineffective message so that you could see for yourself the type of messaging you're putting out there, what we call touch points, whether that's your website, a flyer, doesn't matter. That message has to hit the mark. People see anywhere between six and 10,000 advertising messages every single day. So what is going to make your message stand out? to the underserved, underrepresented populations that you're really wanting to attract in your program. Then we built on that and said, okay, now that you know what a good message is, how do you tell a story? And what is that process like? So we gave you a roadmap for telling a success story because in this webinar, we're gonna show you how to combine the messaging and the storytelling into um, deploying those messages, particularly through public relations strategies. So what are we going to cover in this webinar? 
So in this webinar, specifically, we're getting into earned media. And you may ask, well, what is earned media? So that is any kind of publicity or exposure that you garner from methods other than paid ads. So we're going to give you some case studies today in workforce and education so you can see how PR is applied. But before we do that, Annika is going to take you through exploring PR trends, public relations, why is it important? And we're going to learn three strategies, including how to create the media list, how do you monitor, and how, most importantly, how you pitch the media. Um, if you have any questions and comments, I'm going to be monitoring the chat as Annika is going through the slides. So please feel free to put your questions in there and we're, we're happy to stop at any point and answer your questions. So Annika, if I was on the, on the call, I'd be like, okay, what is PR really? And you are PR queen. So you are so destined for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So we can level set with the definition from the Public Relations Society of America. PR is about influencing, engaging, and building a relationship with key stakeholders across numerous platforms in order to shape and frame the public perception of an organization. So that can encompass a lot of things. It could even include comments, testimonials, things people say about you on social media platforms. Uh, but today we're really, as Selena said, we're going to focus on the earned media and there's going to be a lot of information. There are a lot of sites and resources that we're going to tee up. So don't worry if you don't catch them all. This will be available as a replay. We also have downloadable worksheets and the deck for you um, because we're trying to provide and arm you with as much information, but to make it a more seamless, simpler process uh, because I know it can get very convoluted sometimes when you're trying to think about, well, how do we add one more thing to our marketing when we don't have a big team or we don't have a big budget? Perhaps you do have a PR dedicated public relations officer or PIO, and that's fantastic too. Um, but we also find that a lot of times with our work that we are working directly with adult education, the systems, the CTEs, or with workforce development, maybe outside of the spectrum of what the PIO is doing. So as we know, you all are still the best kept secret. And this is nothing new. This is something that's been going on for decades. And it really should be. Adult educational organizations should be loud and proud and out there because this is the future of education um, and this is the future of workforce. So PR will help enhance reputation management. It can help elevate your brand awareness and credibility, and it does help generate leads. Now, this is something in the former days, we talked about silos in the last workshops um, where everybody did things as silos. So marketing was here advertising, PR, now you can't have that. They have to work as an ecosystem. And so we have seen that PR does help with that awareness that then helps generate the right kind of leads for you and your partners. So there are several trends in PR. One is that traditional earned media is becoming more difficult to secure. As we know, there are a lot of changes going on. Some journalists are having to leave the industry, find ways to pivot publications that are general publications um, are looking for advertising dollars. There's a whole slew of issues that they're dealing with before they even get to what is the content going to be. We also find journalists are moving from position to position. For instance, we had a journalist friend at Fortune Magazine who worked on education, then they moved to over to real estate. So now she's no longer able to take the pitches for the area that we knew her in and um, engage with us. Luckily, she's hoping hopefully helping tee us up with other contacts. But as we see contacts shift and we see traditional EDS shift, it is becoming more difficult to navigate that landscape. We see that LinkedIn is the top social network for communication strategies. So having thought leadership, having articles on LinkedIn as part of earned media is great. And AI is being used to craft pitches, write press releases and write social copy, which is very relevant. But if a journalist can tell that you didn't personalize it at all, they can tell it's AI generated, they will delete the pitch without even reading it. Uh, we're also finding now Google searchabilities is starting to do the same thing and push down content that is completely all AI. We do see that online media platforms are more and more important. We know that most people get their news online. Uh, you know, some of us still get an old fashioned newspaper at our, at our doorsteps, but even with getting that, I still turn to online to get the majority of my news. 
And podcasts are a huge part of the strategy that is evergreen content that could be repurposed in multiple ways. And so it is, it, it acts as a multiple prong strategy for earned media. And it's something that we highly encourage our customers and clients and partners to get involved in. So on the journalist side, as I mentioned, economic uncertainty has impacted the work of about two thirds of journalists. They are being affected by AI. They're being affected by lack of funding as traditional advertisers go away and also disinformation campaigns. And um, they're also less likely to cover virtual events now. Now that we're back mostly in person, they wanna cover things in person and get people together and create that community, which is something that we see as a huge opportunity for adult education systems and workforce development boards is that in-person feeling. And so knowing that, that's a great way to talk about with local media, what you're doing to serve the local community. Journalists also do look at social media. So they will look at social media, they'll look at website, they'll look at everything to see, are you really who you say you are? Can they correlate um, and collaborate the facts and figures that you're seeing in an email and an article that you're pitching with what they're seeing everywhere else. So it's really important to have a cohesive strategy. And I know that the, I'm gonna tee up a little bit for you, Selena. The fourth webinar is where we bring all three of these together, plus plus, uh, and talk about that. Uh, we also know that journalists prefer personalization. They wanna know you're not just sending a message out to everybody. They wanna know that you've read what they're writing that so that they know that you're really researched and that it's relevant to what they write about. So we look at 2024, there are a few trends, AI content generation, which we discussed, data-driven PR. Journalists love it when you include um, a graphic or if you include some data about success stories, you all have data. And we know that we're collecting it also through CoAbe. And so the more data you can include with testimonials, the better. AI is being used a lot for conducting research. People are really looking to social responsibility, um, digital PR, as we mentioned, which also does a lot of backlinks and helps build up your SEO. A lot of people are now looking at pitching without press releases, talking about employee advocacy, new social media platforms, which are always coming out, and micro-influencers. So AI and data-driven, I think, are the two main things that you want to get out of that, and then a little bit of also the digital strategy. Hey, um, Annika, I just put in the chat that if we go over any term that needs clarification, please let us know. So you threw out a couple there. Can you mm. go back to that slide? Um, I think it was SEO. Uh, maybe just touch on that. Maybe some of the acronyms, like what they mean and sure. how they apply in their world. That would be great. So uh, search engine optimization is how you appear on Bing, Google. I said Bing first, even though it's not the biggest platform, obviously, but it's still relevant. Um, and so when people are searching, we know that Google is also serving more ads. So you might see four ads before you get to organic content. The more articles, the more podcasts, the more your name, your school's name, um, your organization's name is out there, the more that the Google algorithm will learn that you are associated with these keywords of adult education, higher education, skill building, workforce development. Um, and so continuing to use those and get out into the world of earned media just helps perpetuate um, the positive search engine optimization and put you up higher on the rankings. And then it's the same thing with the website. You want to make sure you have links to all of the different publicity that you have. Is that good? All right, thank you. And yes, please, because this is there's a lot to cover. So I'm going to go a little bit fast um, with some of the slides. And so please do let us know if you need us to, if you have any questions. So when you're Actually, preparing... Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I keep it right there. Tammy, Tammy has a question um, about AI in the chat. Hold on, hmm. let me pull it back up. I just had it. Um, she's saying, well, you talk about AI content generation. How do you see us using that, using AI to create our press releases? Mm -hmm. I think it, a lot of this goes back to AI can probably get you started, but that personalization and, you know, you know, reporter's not going to see it completely, you know, or, or build it as credible if it's completely AI generated, right? Yep. So the best cases for AI are to, uh, one, one thing that I love to do is, I'll write something, I'll start with the statistics that I want to include, and I'll put it into AI and I'll say, give me three examples you know, of different language to use for these concepts. And so sometimes AI will just make what I've already written a little more flowery. 
Um, and so that's a way that it can help so that it's not written by AI, it's written by you. Um, but we would also sometimes use it when we're thinking about what's a good headline to put in a subject, which we're, we're gonna get to when we do the email pitch. So when you're thinking about what should I put in to make the perfect email subject line that somebody's going to open, because AI will think about what terms are being used the most. So you could say, I need a, an email pitch line that has X, Y, Z. So it could be a percentage. And you'll see some examples that we've given as well. And I will say some of them came from things that we've done and some of them did come from AI and from me using it in that very way. Um, and so AI really is there as a guiding tool. It's not, to, if, if you have it write something, if you say write a blog post about X, Y, Z or write a press release on la la la, then you're still going to want to go back and make sure that it has the right name. It has the name of your institution, that it has the, your statistics, that it's not just pulling general information. If it's all general and doesn't sound like it's human, that's when they can tell the difference. So, and I, I you know, honestly, we could do a full webinar just on AI. So uh, maybe that's it. Maybe we'll have to add a part uh, five. <laughs> well, maybe part five. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about how to create media lists to find the right media, the right journalists, how to monitor media to see what people are talking about, what trends are happening, and also what people are saying about competitors of yours that might be an advantage for you, crafting the perfect email pitch, and then how do you then start pitching the journalists? So the media list is a document, and we have an example, I believe on the next slide, with details of specific journalists, bloggers, writers, editors, and influencers who write about your niche or your area of expertise. Usually you wanna include the name of the journalist, designation, email, name of publication, and a link to their most recent article. That is really important because you wanna make sure that they are still writing about your subject matter. They might've written about it in the past, but as I mentioned, the fortune journalist who was in education, now she's in real estate. So now if I set her a real uh, pitch on education, she's not even going to look at it, right? It's going to go into her trash box. We don't want that to happen. So to build your media list, you want to start with basic research by identifying your target audience, not only who you hope will share your story, but who is meant to watch, hear, or read it. So if you know who your consumers are and you want to get in the local paper, then you then backtrack to go, okay, we know that this has this paper has the biggest reach of potential students and potential participants, potential sponsors, employee partners, et cetera. So who is the right person now at this publication for us to speak to? You can look at the masthead, you can look, you can Google it, or if you already are reading that publication and see the education articles, you can start to follow those people. Uh, and you wanna use technology and media monitoring to stay up to date. There are some tools that we're gonna share with you that can make your media monitoring a little easier. And so to make initial contact with a journalist, you may want to just start following them on social media. That's a point of contact. You might wanna just start following, sharing what they're writing about if it's relevant to your industry, maybe commenting on one of their posts on LinkedIn or another platform. And that helps you build the relationship with them so that when you do pitch them, they already might know who you are and it'd be more of a warm lead than a cold lead. And then you're going to organize your list and keep it current because as we know, journalists are moving around and publications are changing as well. So this is just a sample media list. Google Sheets is a great way for this. Um, and if you have a platform that like we use, Meltwater, there are other platforms out there as well, as well. You can create media lists and you can download them as CSV files and then pop them in so that more people have access. So this is sh just showing, um, and obviously this is uh, a very, Unique list, this is not on education, um, but it shows outlets, names, their role, their email, city, and then some of their social media and a phone number. And then you can take notes. So you could put in some of the platforms, some of the links to articles they've written and then conversation starters. So some things that might help you with figuring out what you wanna to say to them. Um, so here's an example. Your organization just received a grant to help build the pipeline of healthcare workers in your region. Your target markets might be healthcare organizations that need a talented workforce, underserved populations who need career options and qualify for the grant that you just received, and the general community to make them aware of the work that you're doing and how it benefits the community. So your, your media list would then be segmented into healthcare bloggers and influencers, workforce development publications, trade press, and journalists in healthcare, economic development, and education beats. 
So this really helps you think about the same way that we talked about customer personas and how we need to differentiate. You can almost liken it the same to this. So when you're thinking about what your end goal is for your media outreach, then you backtrack and you say, okay, these are the right people to reach out to. So then let's get to media, media monitoring. And again, I'm moving a little quick um, because I wanna make sure we get to those case studies because I think you'll find them very useful at the end. So media monitoring is how we read, watch, and listen to news. And then when we identify and analyze the content for keywords and topics specific to you. So again, it's more than just print. We're looking at online, broadcast, radio, social media, all these different platforms out there. And there are different ways you can set up free media monitoring. So for Google Alerts, for instance, we do this for all of our customers and clients and partners. We set up alerts for their company's name. Um, we set up alerts for key spokespeople from each company. You can look set up key, specific keywords in your industry um, and your competition to see what is being said, who it's being said by, right? And then you can say, oh, this is somebody I should be following now. Um, or, oh, they said this about our competitor, but we know that we have better results. So here's how we can follow up because this will also help get you into that thinking, right? Shifting your brain a little bit to think about how you want to pitch and what are going to be the best ways. Feedly is a free RSS feeder reader that is a top resource for organizing media outlets you're interested in pitching. And then BuzzSumo, you can put in content information, a subject, and the site will crawl for blog posts and sort them according to social media shares. So you can see, I think I want to pitch about this topic. Is that one that's highly relevant right now that people are interested in and engaged in? So BuzzSumo would be a great resource for that. And these, again, are all free tools that you can utilize. Then we have media research resources. So you figured out who you want to reach out to. You figured out maybe you've started following some sources, but now you want to really look at a little more in depth and find the journalists. If you couldn't find the journalists, but you know the publications or the types, this will help you do that. So all top aggregates top news and information in real time. You can look at the editors and trusted sources and really start seeing, okay, these people are players in my industry. Muckrack, you can get a free account on Muckrack, which gives you a limited number of um, contacts, but it is great because you are able to say, and Muckrack stays pretty up to date. So you can look at their extensive database. You can put in a specific publication or a specific name of a journalist and then the publication, then you can search and see if, you know, which journalists are in your industry, or if you search for the specific journalist, reporter, editor, content producer, then you can see what have they written that's relevant to me recently. So are they still a good source for me? And then Hootsuite. So you can tweet a few articles, watch a stream to catch a call out for a source. Um, tweet, I guess that's still the word, but I know on that on Twitter, X, that platform used to be a haven for journalists. It's switching a little bit, but often they would have a hashtag uh, journal request or reporter request. Nowadays, there are other resources you can use, but I also have seen those hashtags used even on LinkedIn. So again, the more you follow the journalists that you think are the right target for you and your, your business, your organization, then you'll start seeing when they're looking for sources. And so that's a great way to think about so when you're establishing media relationships, as we talked about, get to know your target reporter, read their articles, record details that would be pertinent, follow them on social, share their articles, they see that. And when you do eventually establish contact and you want to pitch them, you're going to provide photos, access, and anything else that they could use to write a really meaty story. You don't want to nag the reporter. You want to follow up respectfully. Um, often they're okay with two or three follow-ups within maybe you leave 48 to 72 hours between follow-ups. Um, but any more than that, and they might not, they might push back or they might decide that they don't want to be pitched by you and block your email. So we don't want that to happen. Um, we want to make sure that you're adding value to their jobs. Another thing that we find is that sometimes journalists will hold on to a source. They won't respond to the email but they'll wait and they'll put you in a file so that when they do have the, the right article that they will be able to use you as a source or use your organization as a source. Um, so be patient, it does build time. I've seen uh, journalists come back even six months or a year later saying, oh, we, we 
even somebody appeared um, a year ago and now that anniversary of that event is coming up, we'd like to re-interview them, right? So it is, it, it take, it's a long, it's a marathon, not a sprint, we always say, but it really does help with all of your marketing efforts. So when we look at crafting the perfect email pitch, we wanna start with a strong but short subject line. A rule of thumb has been about 10 words. You wanna make sure that if the email is showing in their truncated email folder, that the most important things are the first words that they see. You wanna personalize the message, including the journal's name, a recent article that they've written or blog post, something that you enjoy or something that relates to your pitch. You wanna be really clear with your message. And this is where AI might not be as good for email messages to the journalists because AI often will add in a lot of very flowery language. Um, and so that's, you, you wanna stay away from that and just get straight to the point. You want to embed the images and links into the email because emails often will get deleted. They don't wanna have lots of extra things that they need to open and they'll often delete those emails without even looking at them. And be timely. We know that a lot of world events can really affect uh, pitches. Um, when big wars start happening or conflicts around the world, even if it's a localized publication, oftentimes journalists have asked us to give them some patience and hold off on pitching for a couple of weeks while they find out what's going on because that those bigger events or even weather events, right? Um, Super Bowl, major holidays. Those are times when people are not really thinking about necessarily education and not looking for those kind of pitches. So here are a few um, pitch subject line examples. So empowering futures, you can say KO, K Coabes, innovative adult education programs for lifelong learning, transformative learning opportunities. So you see that this does have, we're talking about a little bit of action and it is a little bit optimistic, but we want them to get a little, to get excited. Um, so we have many, many, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but then we also have transform lives with, I'll say Coabe, 90% graduates secure better job opportunities. So it's really great if you can include a statistic in your subject line, for your pitch because those are going to be really intriguing and they're going to go, wow, that's an amazing statistic. How do they get there? They're going to open your email and read more. Um, Selena, are we good? Are there any more questions or right now, or should I? There, there are two questions, but we're gonna to get to them when you finish this one section. I okay. would just add right here, when you get your handout, we spent a lot of time on this. Annika really spent a lot of time you guys feel free to use these, but just keep in mind that anything with a quantitative number, of course, has to be verified with sources cited appropriately, right? Yeah, but yeah. You, what we're trying to get you to do here is think about the framing a reporter would look at. That is really the whole thing about this exercise. And it may be not in a way that maybe you've necessarily thought about your organization or program. So we'll get to the other two questions. I've got them here, so don't worry. We'll answer okay. them shortly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So here are some resources for inbound and outbound media. Um, that again, Cision will also help you research media contacts and create media lists. However, it is a paid resource. They don't have the freemium that Muckrack has. Help a Reporter Out is a free service that connects journalists with sources. Um, it, what I will say, if you sign up for Hero, it will give it'll put three emails into your inbox every day. And most of the things will not apply to your organization. So I always advise to use it sparingly, put it into an email box that you don't have to look at all the time. Um, and the other thing is that they're going to be very quick turnaround. So if knowing that many of your organizations might not have the flexibility or nimbility, you're all in a lot of meetings, you're, in, you're doing the work. So you might not be able to answer the questions as quickly, um, but it's one that's good to look at to see what journalists are looking for sources for. Um, MacRack, which we talked about, it also has their social media account, so it makes it very easy to follow the journalists once you find the right ones. And then Quoted, so you can create a free profile for your spokesperson on Quoted. Um, yes, it is spelled with a W. Um, and you can add up to 50 keywords and phrases that the person's an expert on, and then it'll only send you emails with ones that it thinks are relevant to your organization. Now, a lot of times those are also timely, but it's all it's a it's a much better tool in my mind than Harrow. Um, and there are new tools coming up all the time that um, I think I don't know that we have it on one of the slides featured is another one that's similar to quoted, 
but quoted as one we've we've used and really enjoyed. So now we get to the good stuff, email pitch examples. So we have an example of a pitch to reporters, to editors, and for a blog pitch, which also can be tailored for podcasts or for shows. Because what I will say is as a podcaster and somebody who also pitches myself, Selena, and clients for podcasts, it drives me crazy when somebody just says, hey, I'd be a great guest for your podcast. And that's all they tell me. And then they send me a link to their LinkedIn or their website, right? It's That's the same thing I think we're trying to drive home with any of your pitches. It's not just enough to say, I'm a great source. You need to prove why you're a great source. What information do you have? So I'm not, you, I'm just saying all this while you all can read the different pitch examples. Um, and then I'll highlight specific things in each one. Um, so you really wanna make sure what, if it's a blog, podcast, show, a reporter, an editor, that you talk about you know, what you've read that really resonated with you, what you found insightful, um, what the organization does that you think would be relevant to the journal, to the podcast, to the blog, to the radio station, um, to the publication, right? Um, so you want to mention some great statistics. So it could be in the first one, how number of years in the community, what percentage of the population of adult learners have you helped get on a path to a better future? What makes you unique to other organizations, milestones? And then what is the call to action? Do you want them to come for a tour? Do you want to give access to an executive for an interview or an instructor? Um, or do you want to give another call to action? Um, for the editors, same thing. So introduce a spokesperson or executive, talk about what they're an expert on and what they have a story on and why you think this is relevant to the audience. And then come up with some ideas. Love it when people come up with ideas. Same thing for podcasts and blogs. Um, if you want to write, so there's a few things, right? You can do a guest blog pitch, um, which is what this one is for, but you can retailer this a little bit for anything else. And so you wanna talk about what are different topics that are highly relevant. And what we found a lot of times with adult education, with education sector, with workforce development, there's not necessarily one person who wants to be the spokesperson. You might have a team of experts. You might have a couple of instructors who are really subject matter experts that you want to lift up. You may have some deputies so that it's not always the, the role of the executive director, right? To do all of the work and all of the interviews because we know, again, your time is very precious. Um, and so you can spread the wealth. And so by looking at these and coming up with lists, that's a lot of times what we'll do is we'll say, here are, 10 podcasts in education, here are the topics, who would be the right person to pitch for each one so that we can really tailor it. So you can think about it that way for your organization as well. And then this is a survey of how journalists prefer to receive pitches. So 92% prefer to be pitched one to one. So again, not a mass email, or if you are using a mass email tool, at least make sure that their name is personalized um, and you can always go back in and, you know, maybe create a couple of personalizations. 55% don't care which day is they're pitched, but of those who do care, 21% prefer to be pitched on a Monday. 61% do want to receive pitches before noon. So again, day of the week doesn't matter, just in the morning. Um, that's a great thing with email. You can schedule those. So if you're working on something and you're like, oh gosh, it's now four o'clock in the afternoon, schedule it to go out the next day. 67% uh, prefer pitches that are under 200 words. They Again, they want you to get to the point, share what your information is, how it's helpful, what are the great statistics. Um, they also love pitches that connect to a trending story. Those are the most shareable for their audiences. So that is why it's really important to get to know journalists and publications. They're more likely to cover a story if offered an exclusive. So there are some different ways you can do that. You can say this is embargoed. We, we're giving this to you first. If you pass on this, you know, you can even at that point, then you can say, if you'd like to write about this, please let us know within five days and you can put an end date or we will go take this to the next publication. Um, and then one, 45% uh, say one follow-up is ideal. 51% say it should come within three to seven days later. So that 72 hours is kind of the minimum. Um, you don't want to over inundate their email boxes. They're getting a lot of pitches. Most of them are getting hundreds of pitches a day still. Oops. 
we go. Okay, good, great information, Annika. And we do have some questions. I'm going to address them as we go through. Um, you can put anything in the chat box you want, any questions you have, any clarification. There's two burning ones that came up. One is RSS Reader. Can you describe that a little bit more, Annika? Mm. What is an RSS Reader? So an RSS Reader, and a, I apologize um, because I'm not remembering what it stands for right now, and um, but I can, I can Google it when I'm not sharing my screen. <laughs> Um, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it is. Um, so the first podcasts were also RSS. Um, and so essentially, it's a way that the information connects to all the other platforms. So when I upload my podcast to the platform that I use, it creates an RSS feed for that specific episode. And that's what it sends out to Apple, to Spotify, to all of the different platforms that you can listen to a podcast on. So essentially, that's what it means. When you put in the keywords that you're looking for, the key types of articles that are, it, it takes their RSS codes and it aggregates them. Fantastic. So the other, other question came about was what do you do with negative comments? And I want you to answer that from the PR perspective, because someone had said, oh, thanks, Shirley, really simple syndication that she oh, answered at RSS. <laughs> uh, I know you got a million screens going on. Um, the other thing is, you know, you got to think about uh, participants maybe that don't get what they want, they drop out, there's negative comments, et cetera. So one of the things you want to do is proactively tell your story. That's why we have webinars one and two, so that you get out in front of things and you have enough success stories and testimonials and good messaging so that if you do have a comment that comes up, well, that may be an outlier, people may think. But if you don't tell your story and that's the one comment that comes up, then that's the impression you're leaving in the community. And I know that's not what you want. So that's why these webinars kind of build on one another. The strategies are so important around brand building. So Annika, any other thing to add on negative comments? Yeah, we've we've had a few experiences where maybe it wasn't a negative comment, but it was uh, somebody asking for more information on something. And so I think one thing that's really important is to make sure that you have somebody who's monitoring and that you're answering quickly because there's nothing worse for a potential customer, client, student than not seeing an answer come through or having it be some something that is not relevant to the question or the, the concern that somebody shared. Um, the other thing though is in this world of online, there are a lot of people who just like to spread negativity. Uh, I've had it happen. I had a post, I had a blog in the Washington Post many, many years ago about how my daughter didn't get into a certain preschool or kindergarten um, because they said she was bossy. And I said, she wasn't being bossy. She was five and she was trying to understand the directions because they were asking these really complex things of these kids. And I just talked about how we need to reframe conversations and not look at women and even little girls as bossy, but look at them as asking the right questions, standing up for themselves. I got so many comments and I've been told, don't read the comments. Um, so that I had friends who were you know, writing back things for me, but I had to stop because there were a lot of positive, but there were also people who just like to troll. Uh, and so you, there's nothing you can do about that. But if it is something that is relevant, you can say, thank you for your concern. Thank you for your input. We'd love to talk to you more about this. So reframe it so that it becomes a positive and that you're opening up a place to have a conversation, a generative conversation with the person who might be a little unhappy to see if it's something you can solve. Now, if it's something that's way off left field, you can also comment back to them. It, this is not part of our operating procedure, blah, blah, blah. Like just make sure that it's really focused on the positives about your business. Definitely. Uh, Tammy had a question. And I think it's a good one. An announcement about a registration period is open and classes are beginning. Would you consider that a pitch? I send these out to local area newspapers and never receive anything back from them. Um, and so part of it is no, that's not a pitch in of itself that you've got registration opening. It would be more aligned to webinar number two and telling the story about one of your heroes in adult education and leading that into, oh, and if you want to be like so-and-so, then, you know, here's the value proposition for our registration in our courses. Annika, anything else to add on that? Well, one thing, Tammy, you might want to do is look for local event calendars and put it in that section instead. 
because even though it's not a traditional event like a theater opening or an art show, it is still something that's time bound. And so that mm -hmm. might be, I love Selena's suggestion to lift up success stories. And then you use that to pitch that registration is open because you've had all these successes, right? So that if you wanted to continue pitching it, that's one way. The other thing is you can look at the event strategies, which is um, event calendars is something that we are looking at for a certain um, of our clients for some of their community-based events where they want people to understand what's going on and, how, and that community members can come and access these events that they have. Definitely. Okay, um, let's move on to the case studies because I want to spend about the next almost 15 minutes on the case studies because I think you'll see a lot of this put into action and also keep your comments and questions coming in and we'll address them at the end. So this first case study is actually with COABE and Sharon Bonney, the CEO, came to us and said, you know, there's been some publications that have made some real general assumptions uh, based on both dated practices in place prior to 2016, we owe authorization and national research that did not align to data points tracked by states in adult ed, right? And so the specific areas of concern because of this publication um, was the depiction around the scope of adult education services. Other things like the amount of time students are engaged in the services, especially, especially around earning a high school equivalency type of industry certifications issued by each type of adult program, the comparative cost per student and the validity of quarterly data gain comparisons uh, comparing the two types of secondary credentials. So in, in because of that, we put together a campaign called Impacts That Count. And this was really important because we wanted to have a big publicity campaign as part of September. Uh, and yeah, if you could go to that website, uh, this is the little microsite that we set up for the campaign. And um, we developed, I don't, I'm not seeing it on the screen, Annika, you might oh, have shoot. to. Okay. You might have to stop and then reshare, but yeah. we developed this little booklet and we're pointing this to you so that you can really take a look at the data points that were developed and use those actually in your pitches with reporters using your local data. There's actually a template, I think a webinar we did on this and a template to build in your local data. So you can see we've got evidence-based uh, information that counts. Um, we really put this whole story together about adult education and the real impacts that it has using the data. And, um, and that's what empl uh, not employers, that's what journalists want to know, as well as the human interest story as well. So highly recommend you go to that website. And then once we had the story in place, Annika, how do we push it out? Absolutely. And I don't know if you can see this now, the e-magazine. Yeah, we see okay. it now. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Definitely. Yes. And just wanted to flag um, that uh, slide four of the e-magazine has some of the statistics that you can utilize. So Definitely. I, let me stop sharing. And the visuals, the visuals yes. too. In that webinar, we had a whole toolkit for you all that you can pull back out and refresh it and use this in your press releases and things like that. You can, I mean, the just use it. That's what we, we want you to do. I think there was a sample press release in there. Um, so that's what we did for the field. But from the national level, uh, there are other things that you did, Annika, to support this. Yes, we did. A, we had um, we wrote an article and we had the spread and the e-magazine. And then we did a press release that coincided with National Education and Family Literacy Week that talked about the week, but then up, upskilled um, workforce tee up for the impact that counts campaign. So we mentioned it in that press release. And then we did some light pitching for bon um, for Sharon and had an Authority Magazine article of five things that should be done to improve the US educational system. We tailored it towards adult basic education. And then I had her on the podcast as well. Um, and we talked about transforming the trans uh, embracing the transformative power of adult education. And so the results from this very mini campaign, which is absolutely fine. You, you don't have to, um, you know, you, you don't have to think that has to be a big, a big, big, big thing that you have to spend months on. You can do little campaigns as well and find that they have reached. This one had over 176 mentions with backlinks to COABE's Impacts That Count website, and then a potential news reach of 163.55 million people. And that was from the press release and the interviews. Um, 
So, you know, we're, we're still working on a few others, but we thought this was good for the first time. And we know, again, knowing that all of you have limited time, you can think about doing just a quick campaign, just get a couple of podcasts, get a couple of articles, blog posts, and a press release. Fantastic. So this next one, someone actually asked about this and they said in one of the webinars, you showed a campaign where we could get listed on a website and people could follow us or not follow us, contact us. That is the Move Ahead with Adult Ed campaign. And the link that you see on the screen is moveaheadwithadulted.org forward slash join hyphen the hyphen movement. And in that, you'll see that there's a toolkit you can download. It's a national campaign to get students engaged in the depth and breadth of adult education, which you can see ties in to the impacts that count campaign, right? Because people maybe think that adult ed is one thing. Well, it's not. Um, so you really want to take this and, and take it another, another step further in helping students understand the depth and breadth and then find you on a locator map. You can get on the locator map, you can download the toolkit, and we'll be covering this specific topic on how you run a local campaign in webinar four. But for now, we did have PR in the toolkit, didn't we, Annika? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there is a press release that you can customize, and there is also a sample email that you could use as a base, as a template, to send out to local reporters. Yeah, so we'll talk about that in the next webinar too. Um, and you know, just talk about how you set up a campaign locally. So PR would be one part of it, but that other toolkit would be as well. Okay, and then the final campaign we wanna share with you is Hacienda La Puente. This is an adult school that is tired of being the best kept secret. How many of you can raise your hand and say, I'm sick of being the best kept secret, right? They're located about 20 miles east of downtown LA in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, and the community of La Puente is predominantly residential and home to about 40,000. They have the most amazing campus. Um, there's a multitude of CTE programs at a cost lower than other schools nearby. And they also have an American Job Center on site. Um, we just finished a first cut of their brand video, which we're going to show you now. And the reason we did a brand video is because it's a fantastic tool to help tell your story, not only to reporters, but the world in general. And, and Annika, you worked with this team a little bit and just share some of the challenges, you know, and why you came up with these strategies, basically. So what we found is a struggle that we think many of you share, which is that they want to position as a market leader, uh, but they also don't want to overshadow coalition partners or lift up any one person as a thought leader or authority over other people. And so that's where we said, okay, let's do another, let's do a short PR strategy that coincides with social media and with a digital advertising campaign. And um, while PR is a long game, again, you can use techniques to just do a short campaign. And a few of those that we looked at is, okay, we know that they're very tight in local community. So we want to make sure that their events are in the local calendar listings, that we're looking and connecting with local journalists, and that we're also vetting other opportunities. For instance, those podcasts that are in education or other publications, inbound journalist requests, but not but sharing the wealth. So it's not just one person who feels the stress of all of the incoming uh, requests and queries, but that multiple people who are each thought leaders in their own sections are the ones who are able. Uh, and I believe James is going to tee up the brand video. Yeah. That would be great. Turn your volume up, folks, so you can hear it. The benefit of a career in technical education is that a student can come to us and in less than a year they can earn a certificate which is going to put them into an entry level position in the career field of their dreams. You should choose Hacienda La Puente Adult Education because I believe we have the best teachers. I believe our instructors are extremely passionate about what they do. They all come from industry. They know their programs really well. And I think we offer the highest quality of education in the state. The reason you should come here is because when you leave, you're gonna be extremely well prepared. You're gonna have been trained by passionate instructors who are using the state-of-the-art equipment.
We offer a training program and experience for our students that is focused and it's affordable and doesn't have all the distractions that students find elsewhere that makes it a very appealing option. Hacienda La Puente Adult Education provides an exceptional education and training program and that coupled with the affordability of our courses is what really sets us apart from the competition, whether it's at a private career college or a community college. If you're interested in enrolling in any of our programs, go to hlpae.com and you can see all that we have to offer and the ways that you can get signed up for our courses. You're not gonna find another culinary program where you learn as much in the period of time that we have or where it's as specialized towards you. We have the best program that you could possibly find anywhere, especially for the price. The price is so affordable um, and most of our students qualify for Pell Grants. And most culinary schools are upwards of you know, $50,000, $60,000 and our program's under $5,000. We teach all the same stuff that any of the big name schools teach, a lot more hands-on even. So it's, it's just a really, really great program that really prepares them for anything that they could want to do in the culinary industry. If you um, like to help people, you care about people, you want to make an impact to your community, I highly encourage you to look into the medical programs here at Hacienda La Puente. Hey, fantastic. So that's an example of a brand video. Um, we've got about four minutes left, Annika. So I just want to share with you that there's two other slides in here on additional resources and things. Again, I know we overload you with information <laughs> and the slides are very, very text heavy, but we do that for a reason. We really want you to use it as kind of a guidebook. Um, there's a lot of interest in what we are, are doing here and what you all are doing. And I would, I'm gonna put in two links right now in the chat box and maybe go to the next slide. We'll go to that one later, uh, one more. Yeah, so there's two things. There's an upcoming webinar. I'm gonna put the link to register for that. That's kind of the culmination of all of these webinars one through, uh, one through three. Um, into a campaign. How do you take all this and then using the Move Ahead with Adult Ed Toolkit, really create a localized campaign for your organization? Secondly, I, you know, there's some really great questions in here that I'd love to get into. Like Anselmo has, is really giving us a specific case study. Those mm -hmm. are the things that we really go deeper into our, uh, if you can go back to the previous slide and our full course that we have one more, which is called the Brand Amplifier for Workforce and Education Professionals. We just are doing a COABE uh, with COABE. Um, they're going to be an affiliate. So this course is going to be discounted for COABE members. You'll be getting more information on that probably in the next two weeks. We're in the process of getting that up on COABE's website. The other thing I'd really encourage you to do is register for our pre-conference session, uh, which is called Building an Effective Adult Ed Brand, The Art of Storytelling, Student Campaigns, and Targeted Outreach. It is You do not have to be in Nashville to come to this. It can be done virtually online for $75. It's three full hours and a toolkit to help you kind of build that communications plan that you need. So I want to make sure that you know that. Oh, good. Carolyn just registered. You can uh, click on that link, register. Again, you don't have to attend the full conference or you're not planning to go. I'm planning to be there in person. So if any of you, uh, and I have, we have two other workshops at that conference as well, one on uh, employer engagement campaign that we're doing in the state of Illinois, and then another one around local campaigns. One is Move Ahead with Adult Ed, but there's also another one called Your Path, Your Future. So you'll get to hear from different types of folks and different campaigns. That's another workshop. So we'll be there. If any of you want to um, connect with me at the conference, get in touch with me through Whova, or you can also um, get in touch with me on my email. I'm going to put it up right now in the chat marketing.com. Um, if you want to consult with me before then, then go to fullcapacitymarketing.com and click on contact us. It'll take you to a form. 
Um, okay, Shirley, let's get to the questions here in the last few minutes. Uh, last minute, do you plan to do any other training on using Google ads and other social media marketing once we have assets developed? Absolutely. If you go back to the course that we developed, Annika, on that slide, um, and this is under our e FCM Learning Hub. It's a 10 module course and we take you through, you have all the templates, everything you need, it's 10 modules. So you go through that on your own. There's also another package that you can do with train, with uh, coaching as well. So there are a lot of flexible ways you can work with us. Again, I would highly recommend go back and look at the, the uh, webinars one and two, and now this one again, because it's a lot of information to absorb. They will be posted on COABE's website under archived webinars. I think it's in the resources tab. You can look around or you can get uh, get in touch with me and I'll try to locate the exact links for you. Um, secondly, sign up for webinar number four. Thirdly, attend the pre-conference session uh, for $75 to get the toolkit, three hours of this. So Annika is going to be online monitoring all your questions. I'm going to be in Nashville teaching the group. We're going to combine everything together. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, so I really hope you attend. And it's on a Sunday. So you guys can get up on a Sunday morning before you go to church or get on with your day or whatever you're planning to do. So um, uh, with that, I think that's all the time we have. I'm going to stay on just a few minutes to see if you have any other questions. Um, if not, I'm going to turn it back over to James to close. Wow, what a presentation. I was taking notes. Thank you both so much. What a wealth of information. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, um, from logging in from all across the country. Um, I want to thank Selena and um, Anika for the presentation again, and I hope to see everybody in Nashville. It's going to be a great conference. There's a lot of excitement. Um, registrations are through the roof right now, so there's going to be a lot of people, um, a lot of activities. We have a lot of really good stuff planned, and of course, this presentation in our pre-conference, um, I'm really looking forward to now. Uh, so it's going to be great. I hope to see everybody there, and if you have any Closing thoughts, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and close it out. Hey, James, just out of curiosity, do you happen to know the numbers of folks attending uh, the conference, either online or in person? I know you're selling out of the hotel. Yeah, we're, we're almost sold out of the hotel. Uh, right now, registration stands at just short of 2,000, so which is pretty high for this early. There's still two months to go. Um, so, yeah. And I don't know what the breakdown is between virtual and in-person. I think the vast majority of this year are in-person. So Nashville it's will so great. Do that. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to see everybody. You know, virtual is really fun too. There's been times where I haven't been able to get out and I've only been on the Whova app and virtual. And that's been really great too, because people use that Whova app a lot. Um, and it's it's really fun. So anyway, you come, we hope to see you. I hope connect with us so we can, you know, do a consultation, grab a coffee or what have you. Would love to see everybody. So thank you so much. Thanks, James. And thanks, Annika, for thank you. spreading your wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day and a good rest of the week. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.